Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. What a joy it is to be together this morning. Um, we are in the midst of something known as Lent. We've been talking about Lent for uh, quite a few weeks. Uh, we've been talking about Lent for quite a few days, 40 to be exact, right? So we're in a 40-day journey. And for some of you, you didn't come from a tradition that celebrated Lent. And so we've been sort of talking about what is Lent, why do we do it, all those sort of questions. Because we know that as we've been growing as a church community, some of us are like super Methodist, right? Like John Wesley Jesus, pretty close, right? Some of us are like, I don't even know who she's talking about right now. Um, some of us are like, I grew up, I think non-denominated. I don't know what I was. And some of you are like, it was warm and I walked in this morning. Like that's about the different levels we have, right? There's all kinds of different understandings. And so we're not going to take for granted that everybody knows what Lent is or why we do it. For me, Lent has always been an important part of my practice of faith because I never understood Easter without understanding the journey toward it, right? For me, it's it's really hard that all of a sudden, like next week, uh, there will be churches that will start celebrating Easter like Thursday, right? But what about the pain of Good Friday? The the lostness of Holy Saturday when when things unanswered are prayed for, right? For me, there is beauty in the practice of the pilgrimage. So we've been talking a lot about pilgrimage, and we've been using um, sort of tangible reminders. So I'm going to go through those again, as I have every week. If you don't have your first United Methodist goodie bag, we I, that can't be called a goodie bag. That's got to be really bad. That's that's blasphemy, probably. But um, we have a bag of items that we have been uh, collecting every week. If you don't have one, we'd love uh, to get you one out there. Or if you have some of the items and not all of the items that are inside here. As we've been talking about a pilgrimage, we thought... What We're forgetful people, right? We need to be reminded about what a pilgrimage is and what we need to bring with us. Anyone who backpacks knows you always have to have the right things with you. So as we started this pilgrimage together, the first thing that we gave out, remember we talked about the fact that we needed to sort of create space, right? We needed to create a holy space during uh, Lent. And so we gave you oil. And this oil uh, was oil that was actually from a recipe that is actually in the Bible. So uh, the oil right here, as you can see, is from Exodus. It is when the the people were on the journey of 40 years. We only have to do 40 days. We're lucky there. When they were on the journey for 40 days and got super lost, um, they would remind themselves that the space was holy by putting holy oil outside of the tent that served as their church. Or any time they were in a conversation that was temple-like, they would make sure to have this holy oil. And so that first week we gave you oil to remind you as you journey into this pilgrimage of Lent, you're going to have to set space and time apart. And sometimes the world is really hard to sort of focus on this journey. And so like I said, I keep, anytime I've used this, guys, it's been in traffic. So you can decide what kind of person I am. All right. The next thing we uh, gave you was a little compass. Do you guys remember the little compass? Um, and I'm told it actually works. Uh, so this little compass was a reminder that oftentimes people tell us during this pilgrimage of faith that we're on is that there are certain, this is the way it's meant to be. We have to do it this and we have to, do, and then life experience, it's really hard to maintain our faith in that. So what is our compass? What is guiding us? So for us as a community, we decided that really what's our compass are the fruits of the spirit, Right. Where do we see the manifestation of who God is in the fruits of the Spirit? So we use a compass as the fruits of the Spirit. Now, the next thing we gave you are very tiny, and you're not going to be able to see it, but just believe me when I say that I'm pulling it out right now. We talked about how when Jesus came into Jerusalem, one of the things that he did was drive folks out of the temple. And so there's tiny bricks, because remember the speech that he gave is, I will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And everyone's like, that's not how construction works, Jesus, right? Uh, But it was a reminder that Jesus indeed and all of us are the temple of God. And we also talked about that week um, 
Many of us are in the sort of process of maybe leaving the faith we had known before, or the, our understanding of the faith we had grown up with. And so for us, sometimes it's easy to throw away the bricks of our past, but if we're building a new temple, we can include those bricks, like reclaim wood. You know, you don't burn it down, you use it again, and you make it into something new and beautiful. So we talked about the bricks of our faith, some that we want to get rid of and some that we want to keep. The next thing we talked about was being separated from the world, right? We talked a little bit about how I had no idea what the knot of this world... Does anyone else get confused by the knot of the world sticker? Thank you, Sean. Like, I spent weeks going like... And I also shared, like, the he is greater than I sticker. Thought it said hecky. So I am really good at figuring those things out. Um, But we talked a little bit about how knot of this world often gets sort of misunderstood as if we are people in the midst of a community and we're not meant to be part of it, but somehow separate if we are believers in Christ. And we talked more about that's not actually it. See, in the midst of darkness or difficulty, uh, it often just takes a little light. And it would be much more dramatic, guys, if we had like better lighting in here. And so I just need all of you to imagine that it went really dark in here and then this light lit up everything. Are we all together on that? Perfect. Uh, So we talked a little bit about how it only takes a little bit of light to light things up. So if we're separated from the world, if we're on a pilgrimage and we're separated from these things, so set apart with the oil, separated from people with the compass, separated from our previous faith communities or, or the faith community that we understood was our brick, and then separated from the world was our light bulb. And now last week, beautifully, Adam uh, gave this wonderful uh, talk about how when we are separated and we're on a pilgrimage, it can sometimes feel as though we're dying, right? One of my favorite things he said is from one of my favorite quotes, which was like, sometimes when we think we've been buried, we're actually planted, right? And so he uh, gave us little vials of seeds, right? Because when we're buried, when it feels like we're separated from everything, it is difficult. And we've all been there, right? We've all felt separated from our world, separated from the views we had before. And so he gave us this vial of seeds. Now you're all wondering, what's this week? No, you're not. Well, I I wanted to build the anticipation, but you're all staring at me blankly. Um, So this week we have for you a palm cross. And some of you may have grown up. Did any of you grow up getting these in church? Um, normally in churches in the old days, uh, like five years ago, people used to, uh, make these the week, like the year before's palm branches, they dry them out. Your pastor is not that skilled. So, um, you'll notice that they're symmetrical and actually look good because we ordered them. Um, I did not make these, uh, but it is this beautiful reminder. And we're going to talk a little bit about why this palm cross. So if we're in the midst of a pilgrimage, something happens during the end of a pilgrimage, And maybe you know this because how many of you out there are marathon runners or half marathon runners? Raise your hands. I think they count. Okay, perfect. Like three of you. I love this. So every year um, I run a a marathon, a half marathon. I do not run a marathon. You people are insane. I run a half marathon. And I run it in uh, Vancouver, BC. And it is so much fun. And it is this incredible experience of running around the seawall. And I tell this story because it is a bit of a pilgrimage for me. Every year when I train, I get one injury. I don't know why, but it just happens for me. So it'll either be like my hip or something. So by the time I get to the race day, I'm always like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to complete this. And I run for uh, with an organization, Lululemon. It's a it's a shop. Uh, it really expensive pants, um, and they're really good because once you buy a pair, it's like a little bit of a cult because you're like, I need those pants. Um, Everyone has them, and they all run this race together, and everyone gets excited. And what they do for us for the weekend is they don't just make it a race, it's, and they won't call it a race. They call it an experience, a Lululemon experience. And so you pay for this experience, and you show up, and everyone uh, brings their yoga mats. Can you imagine an entire city of people wearing uh, Lululemon. Just go to Fashion Island and imagine then if all of those people were an entire population of a, of a city. Now, the best part is that every year that I've gone, it's been the same week as Comic-Con. Can you imagine these two cultural understandings in the same city at the same time? So, like, that's the only week, by the way, that I walk around and act like I always drink kombucha and wear yoga pants. Um, I, but everyone kind of walks around looking like that. Or you have people like in full Sailor Moon, and we're just kind of in the same lines, 
getting coffee together. It's beautiful. It's like the kingdom of God. It's gorgeous. So all these people kind of uh, getting together. It's an odd, odd weekend. But they build this thing in you where the first you do yoga together and they're, you know, they're like Sarah's doing the cult. Um, and, and it's wonderful. You're just kind of in this space and everybody is super fit and you feel really fit and you're eating like healthy things and everybody's eating healthy. It's just the greatest. And they get you ready for the race, but they're smart. Lululemon is smart because they have a sale a sale the day before that only runners can go to. So you have to wear your running number and only runners can go to this sale. We wake up at 3 a.m. I make fun of all of you who do Black Friday, but I do Lululemon Friday. I wake up really early and I get in the line and I don't even know if I want anything, but I'm like, well, everyone else is in a line. Do you know what I'm talking about? That like fear you have that you're gonna miss out. And so you get up really early and you get in this line. And the thing that's funny about all of it, and the thing that I can't quite wrap my brain around is that nothing is on sale. Everything is full price, but we act like, oh my goodness, these $90 pants that will clearly make me look better and be a better human are totally worth getting up at 3 a.m. the night before I run 13.1 miles. I don't know how they figured this out, but there's this like excitement they build around it. They have like dancers in the line. This year, they had us meditate in the line. 3,000 people in a line meditating together. You could hear a pin drop. What is happening? Well, there's excitement building around something. And then when you start the race, whether you think you're a good runner or not, you're, it's so much fun. The, the people they have who pace us, they wear these crazy hats, which is... It kind of hurts my feelings that the people I run with are so like able to run my pace that they're holding signs and wearing weird hats and tutus. And meanwhile, I'm like dying. I'm dying as I run. But there's this thing that happens where my, my heart just gets so excited because, oh my gosh, I get to run the Lululemon race. I'm, I know I've bought into this thing. And everyone's around and we, we sing the Canadian national anthem, which makes my heart so happy. And we sing it in both languages, which also makes my heart. So, and then we sing the American national anthem. And then we run 13.1 miles like it's a good idea. And it starts off fairly fine. I used to be a sprinter. So like at the start, I have to remind myself, you're not in a race for the first part, Sarah. Like don't try to sprint because I've done that before. Like tried to sprint, but it's 13.1 miles. And I get really like edgy about it. Like I'm excited about this run. I'm going to do it. Are you guys feeling it? Can you feel the excitement? Some of you are like, I would never run unless any, someone was chasing me. Right. But again, if you were there, you would run because everyone else is running. And the hard part, this thing that they do is sort of shaming those of us who aren't running it in like one hour, um, is you walk by the starting people and they're not human. You know what I mean? You know the guys in the gym who you want to say to like, you're done. You can go home. Like, these are the guys, like, in the start, they're in the start of the race, and they're just, like, standing there, and you're like, you've already won, like, please, and you have to walk by them, like, the walk of shame to the other uh, level, and you're just like, okay, my time's a little, and then you pretend, like, I'm just going to go use the restroom, actually, I'm going all the way to the back, and so for me, as a, as a competitive runner, it's hard for me to, like, not be in the first corral, but, but then they, they kind of get you, like, pumped, because there's this moment where you run on the bridge and it's just when it's like mile seven and you're starting to go, this maybe was the worst idea I've ever had. I know my pants look good, but man, I am dying on the inside. And it's this moment, they've got it figured out, where you will cross the bridge at the same time as the winners. So you're going this way and they're running this way, just abs of glistening. And then there's this guy who is from Orange County who dribbles basketballs. It's so, it's so hurtful. It's almost as hurtful as when the pregnant woman runs by you. But so he's like dribbling basketballs, sweating. And you're like in this, but you're like, I am a winner. I can do this. And so you run it. And then there's this thing that happens for me mentally at mile 10. At mile 10, I just hit a wall. I always hit a wall at mile 10. And I may have been running my best race, doing really well, checking my, I'm doing well. And at mile 10, I go, yeah, I think I'm done, which is not what you can do at that point. And they've got it figured out because right at mile 10, a year ago, they had a screen. And what they hadn't told us is that they had asked different people to like cheer for you. 
So they have our number, which is on our feet. This should scare people that we have this technology. That when you cross a thing and you don't know you've crossed it, it cues up people to yell your name. So if you've hit a wall and somebody yells your name, like, Sarah Heath, you're the best. And you're like, you're right, I am the best. And you just like keep running. Or you're like, this is embarrassing how slow I'm going. And if that doesn't work for you, they have people dressed as mermaids over on this side. They have the entire Vancouver fire uh, like team are there, like spraying you with hoses. And you're like, this is awesome. I'm a winner. And you forget that you're in the midst of the hardest run of your life. And then you end the race in this beautiful way where all these people who don't even know you have been told your name. So that when you cross the line, everyone's like, Sarah, and you're like, yeah, and you think you're special until you hear like, Tiffany, who's also behind you, or whoever is running with you. Last year, I was uh, injured to the point where I didn't even think I'd be able to run the race. I had um, torn a calf muscle, which sounds as fun as it is. And so um, my friend who I always go, this is our like trip that we do together. She had come with me for this journey, this pilgrimage, if you will. And she was so excited, and she said, I have to admit to you, I'm a little bit excited because when you're injured, you run the same speed as me. And so I was really, if that makes me sound really fast, I'm really not that fast. I was really excited to run with her because at the end of the race, we held hands and crossed the finish line. It was beautiful. It was exciting. Why am I telling you this story? Because I want everyone to know that I finished a half marathon. No. Um, humble brag. No, I really want us to think about that feeling. Because what we often don't recognize about Jesus' triumphant entry, and I use the word triumphant because that's what's in, you know, oftentimes in scripture it'll say like triumphant entry above it. What's interesting is that this is the moment when Jesus will enter and be in many ways what people were hoping he would be, this victory lap that he's taking. But it's a hard walk. To travel from Jericho up to Bethage, up to Jerusalem is actually 800 feet below sea level up to 3,000 feet. Who's, who's, who are my hikers out there? That is not fun. And it's interesting because Jesus has walked everywhere in scripture so far. And yet this time, Jesus calls for a cult. And, and people often wonder, like, all of a sudden, did Jesus get lazy? Like, what is happening here? Why is he doing that? And we actually know, no, he's doing that to fulfill a prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So as Jesus is setting up this triumphal entry, the folks who have been on pilgrimage, because you have to remember, this is beginning Holy Week for the Jews as well, because we're heading into Passover. They are waiting for their king to come, and here he comes. The same way that triumphant leaders from military had come before. See, before, when the, the armies of Israel had beat Syria, someone had come in from the exact same gate, and everyone knew the story. So once someone is riding in on a colt, they're like, this is it, this is the moment. And everyone goes and gets palm branches and throws their coats on the ground. It's beautiful, right? This beautiful moment where he is going to be what we are hoping he is going to be. He is this victorious leader. Yes. We all know the story, right? So the, I remember cheers turned to jeers, right? This isn't the last time Jesus will enter Jerusalem. See, Jesus will leave Jerusalem and will come back in cuffs. So this victorious, why is he doing this pageantry? And I think he's doing this pageantry to remind us that we are separated from this crowd. Yes, Jesus will be a king, but not like the 200 years ago. You know, it's funny. The uh, king that came in before for defeating Syria, do you know what his first name was? Judas. Back then you could name your kid Judas as like a way of honoring him, which is funny now. Like imagine you name your kid Judas. Like this kid's kind of a turncoat. Judas. Like you're setting that baby up to have issues. But back then it was such an honor because Judas had been the one who had defeated the Syrian army. So there is a sense of royalty here. And we know that too because there's a radically different definition 
of what the crowd is celebrating when we look at this. Because his military prowess is not what Jesus will be known for, but that's what they're setting themselves up for. They are excited because this guy is going to kick butt and take names. I think about my own faith. I think about how many times I've like super joined in with the parade, right? I, I remember when I used to go to a church that was so experiential. I just loved it. I loved it. I got so into it. Like it was kind of that crowd mentality. But I had grown up United Methodist. So I started with my hands like here. Like, okay, I can do this. And then I went one hand up. This is like when I was starting to be evangelical. This is where I went. I don't know what this is here. And then like slowly, slowly my hands. And then I was just full hill song. You know what I mean? Like it's like a movement for me. And I just loved it because there was this like experiential thing, this crowd mentality. It was beautiful and I wanted to be a part of it. I loved it. And it was only later that I discovered that crowd I had become they, it, part of. They, they weren't okay with who I was as a female leader. And that was very confusing for me at the time. I wonder how many of us have been part of a crowd before that we really thought we fit into. Like, this is my, this is my tribe. And then as we continue to follow Jesus, we discover, wait, I don't fit in with this tribe. Or maybe even the way that you see Jesus is a little different. So the crowds that were once yelling for Jesus to be the king later will be yelling, crucify him. We don't quite know what to do with Jesus's kingship. See, the word Hosanna means save us, right? Save us. Help us. So what Hosanna means, save us. So they're yelling that, save us, but they have an idea of how they want Jesus to save them, and it's by the sword. I don't know if you know, but yesterday there was a bit of a parade around this stuff, a march, if you will. And however you feel about guns and gun control, I'm not American, so I have a very different, like, understand. I'm like, just give the gun up, but that parent, that's not how that goes. Um, I've become American, and I moved to Mississippi, so I learned a lot about guns, um, However you feel about it, it is difficult to deny the beauty of the children leading us. And it's actually quite scriptural, by the way, for children to lead us in seeing like who Jesus really is in all of this. Where would Jesus be during all of this? This parade, this march, I find it very, very interesting. My little liturgical heart finds it really interesting that that happened yesterday and today is Palm Sunday. But what do we know happens? Is that around these things, oftentimes the empire doesn't do well with the celebration of that kind of kingdom. I love, uh, I want to read to you from Isaiah. It's just this beautiful uh, vision of what the kingdom of God is about. And we've talked about this, right? That we are in the midst of the yet and not yet. As we've been on this pilgrimage, we know that we won't quite get there. It isn't time yet for us maybe to cross the line fully and hear our name yelled. But listen to this. He will judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This is the kingdom of Jesus. It's a peaceful one. And it's one that requires us to let go of the things that we have been weaponized with. Whether it's our angry words, whether it is indeed our weapons. This is an odd thing because, again, how many of us are still stuck in understanding Jesus to be the warrior king? Sometimes my heart turns a little bit ooh, when I hear these victory songs about Jesus. Because I imagine him being like, no, Sarah, that was Palm Sunday, Jesus. And that was just to prove a point. Like I moved beyond that, right? And we know there is a sense of victory in our belief in Jesus. There is the sense of like the power to see the kingdom around us. But Jesus doesn't kick butt and take names. Instead, when Jesus will re-enter Jerusalem, he will enter as our king in a different way, humble, suffering, willing to put the other first, journeying in a way that asks us, are we willing to pick up a cross that says we'll put down our guns? Are we willing to be part of this kingdom? And, and for some of us, no, 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 not yet. But the kingdom of God looks a lot different 
than we think it does. And that's hard, isn't it? Because we, we are such a people of fear. So I want to remind us that we are on a pilgrimage and we won't always get it right and it won't always be easy. The children lead us. How are we willing to accept that Jesus is not the warrior king? And then how do we really experience Jesus as the king that will so humbly walk towards the cross? Friends, this week I want to invite you, as you hold sort of this uh, reminder that this is victory, but this is what our faith is, a dried up cross. A reminder of humbleness, steadfastness, these last forever. This beauty that maybe it's not quite as beautiful as this, but instead it's, it's raw and it's small. And I don't always understand it. How do we live into that kingdom? And it's not always popular. And it may mean that we don't get to be part of the crowd that's screaming and cheering and jeering. But it's beautiful. And it's who Jesus was. I am so grateful for this season, for this time as we prepare for Easter. I love Easter, but I love Holy Week too. I want to invite you to pray with me now as we enter into what it really means to live a life walking towards the cross. God, we are grateful for Holy Week, for the symbolic nature of all that happened, whether it be that you rode in on a horse to remind us of Zechariah, whether it be that you remind us that guns no more, plows will, or swords will be turned into plowshares. God, we are grateful for the way you, you move. Challenge us this week as we, the times that we jump in with the crowd. Help us to examine our own hearts. Help us to become a people of peace, whatever that may look like. God, mostly we thank you for the journey that we're on with you, this great pilgrimage. We pray that one day we will arrive. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You know one of the beautiful things about how God works is this sense of transcending and including. You know, earlier I shared the story that I had joined a community where we raised our hands and I really wanted to be a part of it. And there was a time when I just didn't want to, like, accept any of that. Like, oh, those people. But you know what? The beauty is, as I've been growing in my faith, is that I can now raise my hands in a different way. And it is a way of saying, like, God, I'm with you in this. And so I just want to offer us a moment to do that together. Can we just raise our hands however you're comfortable? Some of you are still, like, here. Um, Mike's taking it to the Lord. He's Pentecostal at this point. Um, Why do we do that? Well, it's a a symbol of having our hands open. For some of us, it might even just be in our pockets because we're not ready fully. And that's fine because it is a pilgrimage. But having our hands open is a symbol of being open to what God has for us. So receive this, this benediction as we head into Holy Week. And now may the God of peace go with you. May you be a form of peace, a sanctuary for others. May you be the one who is cheering Hosanna. May we understand that we do have a God who saves us. May we know what that means in our hearts and for others. And may we be blessed, be a blessing. Friends, have a wonderful Holy Week. Amen.